Ken Feinberg has been involved in some of the worst tragedies this country has ever faced. And that includes the Virginia Tech massacre where a gunman killed 32 people eight years ago. We got into that and more in the second part of my conversation with Feinberg. When it came to the Virginia Tech massacre and the aftermath, and again, uh, you were served as a mediator in that. And I know there's a distinction between a public and private fund. But you decided um, that every life should be worth the same regardless of where you went to work, right? That's correct. That's because, of course, in Virginia Tech, One Fun Boston Marathon, Aurora, Colorado movie shootings, Sandy Hook, Connecticut elementary school shootings, those are all privately funded gifts. It's gift money. It's money from private donors. No recipient of money in those funds signs a release, I will not sue. I will not go to court. You can take that money, hire a lawyer, and go to court if you want. Some did. So when there's no tort overhang, where there's no requirement that you surrender any rights, it's just a gift. I have great leeway in providing whatever formula I want, uh, it doesn't matter that one person who died was married to a banker and another was married to a fireman. All lives are equal. Is that the better way to do it? We talk about leeway. I, I make you Solomon here where you get to rewrite tort law. Should that be the way in the aftermath of tragedy or disaster that regardless um, of your vocation or your expectancy over the lifetime of earned income that everybody should get the same? Yes, that would be a better way. The trouble with the better way, you see, if you decide as a policymaker that you only get the money if you waive your right to go to court, well, you can't give everybody the same amount then. Yeah. If you're trying to voluntarily convince a stockbroker or a banker or a lawyer or an accountant not to go to court, you've got to provide them more of an, a financial incentive than the waiter, the busboy, the cop, the fireman, the soldier. They're not making anywhere there as much. AIG, um, you also served um, in, in terms of a, a fund and distribution, but there's a postscript to that, which is Mo Greenberg sued, and while there was a mixed verdict, he didn't certainly get the, uh, the payment at the end that he wanted. Uh, there was some acknowledgement from the court he had a case. You are eyewitness to history in interesting ways, in, in boardrooms and behind the scenes. There's still a palpable frustration past 2008 that the folks who caused a lot of the uh, you know, problems obviously um, got off without going to jail and let alone in some ways were compensated very handsomely. And there doesn't seem to be an acknowledgement of responsibility and that case for many was perfectly emblematic of it. From your vantage points, um, did folks get it? And sometimes on broader cases, you don't even have to name the folks. Do folks on the corporate level, when there's either malfeasance or ineptitude or whatever else, even cover up, do they get it and the frustration of the general public or not? I think they get it. I, they may ignore it, but I think they get it. I'm not sure how you translate knowledge of public criticism and frustration into how that translates into changed corporate policy. But I can tell you that in my limited role as the pay czar mm -hmm. with AIG, setting the pay of top corporate officials at AIG, Bob Ben Moshe, who was the head of AIG at the time, he got it. And I think the public got it. But um, it was a moment in time which has since passed, of course. You know there's a sense of ungratefulness from the part of the public when they saw the Greenberg suit and said, wait a minute, we're bailing you guys out and now you're suing because you didn't get the deal you wanted? I know it's more complicated than that, but from a visceral level, sometimes you, you get the sense from the public that, wait a minute, there's a disconnect here. I think you get that from the public every single day. I heard that when I was at Treasury doing pay. I was fixing the pay of the top officials at AIG I slashed their compensation by 50%. And still, a view from the public, I think, largely, well, that's all well and good, but why aren't they in jail? Why aren't they uh, uh, working for nothing, not 50%? Uh, what have you done for us lately? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's palpable, and I think it still exists. 
post BP, um, there was an interesting piece in the Times that an unintended consequence um, is that other major corporations, when faced with not the same but a similar situation, may decide not to go to mediation and fight the thing. It may be more profitable in the long run for them uh, to drag this thing out in the courts. Forget about public relations. Because when they look what BP paid out at the end versus what maybe they could, um, and who knows where a court will, and who knows the attention stand of the public, they might do better in the long run. What's your feel on that? Well, that was a great piece that Joe Nassera wrote in the op-ed page of the New York Times, where Nassera said, when BP set up this private program with Feinberg, it worked. It was fair. It was efficient. It worked. We paid out, instead of going to court, BP paid out under this program that I designed and administered in 16 months, six and a half billion dollars of BP money went to victims of the oil spill. Then I left. I was done. BP thereafter entered into protracted litigation with private lawyers, with the government, state government, federal government, and that litigation dragged on for years. And when BP announced that it was paying, what, another $18, $20 billion, after Ken Feinberg largely had resolved all of the individual cases mm -hmm. of, of oil spill damage, that's when uh, the article came out saying, why would a company like BP do this again? You said um, you don't really need a law degree for what you do, uh, really more training in divinity maybe. You really mean that? Well, I do. I don't think a law degree, I think a law degree is a sort of a wash in this business. Maybe it helps me designing a program and assuring everybody of a due process right to be heard, etc. But in terms of dealing with the emotion of day-to-day -day real people loss, my daughter is gone. I remember one time I said to a, um, a, uh, um, a, a victim of the Boston Marathon bombing, he had lost a leg, and I said to him, Mr. Jones, this is terrible what happened to you. I'm going to give you a million one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars tax-free for the loss of your leg. He looked at me. He said, Mr. Feinberg, you're going to give me that money? I got a better idea. You keep the money. Give me my leg back. How's that? Give me my leg back. That's what I want. Mr. Jones, I wish I had that power. I don't. All I can do is give you this check. He said, yeah, great. Thanks for nothing. I mean, that's why a law degree isn't all that helpful. What you really need is to be a student of human nature and to try and deal with people in grief. And that's why I reference a divinity degree or maybe a degree in psychiatry rather than a law degree. Well, it's a great book. And it's not just obviously about the law and the cases, but uh, everything that goes into it in between and even after. Ken, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Up next, the U.S. got rid of Saddam Hussein, but it never got rid of the sectarian problems that still plague Iraq. Just this week, a truck bomb at a Baghdad market killed more than 60 people. Up next, the true story of the attempt to rebuild the country and the volunteer who risked her life many times over to help.